January is over. We're one twelfth of the way through 2023. So it's time to stop and rank all seven January new releases that I saw from the worst to the best. Since we're only one month into the year, that also means you're going to get to find out my current pick for the worst movie of the year, as well as my pick for the best movie of the year. Not that there's a lot of competition. So let's talk about it. My name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the January new releases that you were able to see. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. Also, I missed several movies this month, just kind of life got in the way. One quick announcement, I have three live events coming up in the next two months. I'm going to be at Fan Expo Portland in just a couple weeks and then in March I'm going to be at Fan Expo Cleveland, actually with Austin Burke as well as John Flickinger. And then one week after that, I will be in Orlando at Megacon. At each of these, I'll be doing a couple of panels, meet and greets, all that fun stuff. Save the dates and let's get started. In last place, Kids vs. Aliens. This is a spinoff from a segment in one of the VHS films. It's from the director of Hobo with a Shotgun. I actually saw it back in September at Fantastic Fest. It's a lower budget film. I don't really want to pick on it too much, but it, it really wasn't for me. It, it didn't work for me for a variety of reasons. Kind of has a, a little bit of that it Stranger Things vibe of teenagers acting like teenagers and then having to overcome some fantastical threat. It's that kind of genre, but with the way that it's written, the teenagers are just too cruel, too mean for me to have been able to get invested in that side of things. And then when it gets into the kids versus aliens section of the story, some of it for choices that they just made, some of it for um, budget reasons, the aliens look like putties from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. or something out of Goosebumps. And so I, I couldn't buy into that. It was too goofy while also being kind of mean-spirited and even kind of the number of children that are murdered in it. It just wasn't for me. It ended on a note that kind of put a bad taste in my mouth. So movie I was actually kind of excited to check out, wanted to kind of root for the you know, lower budget film that I was kind of checking out at the festival and it just did not come together for me. Number six, You People. This is a new Netflix film starring Jonah Hill, Eddie Murphy, Julia Louis Dreyfus, as well as David Duchovny. And I loved seeing David Duchovny show up in this film. And it's kind of meet the parents. It's kind of guess who's coming to dinner. It's a story about a Jewish guy that gets engaged to a black Muslim girl. And they're trying to merge the families together. And the parents, uh, well, they don't make it easy. And there's all sorts of awkward cringe humor that comes along with that. As well as social commentary. And I get what they were going for something got really lost in the execution. Now, to be fair, there's no shortage of moments in the movie that absolutely did make me laugh. There's a couple parts in there was like, oh, that's kind of interesting to think about. That's a pretty good little idea. But one of the big things that right out of the gate just, just hurt this entire film is the way every single character talks. We're, they just have this very modern slang in these super niche pop culture references. I don't think I've heard of a man ever who wanted to be in a relationship so badly besides Drake. And I'm talking views Drake. Whether you're talking about Jonah Hill, who's supposed to be that person that's super into culture and runs a podcast and everything, but also Julia Louise Dreyfus, who's his 60-year-old mother. And she also is using all sorts of slang that legitimately, I'd never even heard these terms before. I didn't know what she was saying. And every character talks like this. We got about 15 minutes into it, paused it. And my wife literally said, is this how other people feel when they watch Gilmore Girls? Because I'm not tracking with anything that they're saying. I don't understand any of these cultural references that they're making. I don't know what they're implying. I don't know what that slang means. I'm just, I'm hearing words that are English. I understand the words. I do not understand the sentences. And I was like, me too. I also cannot follow the dialogue in this movie. And kind of even beyond that, it's a movie that's um, so soaked 
in like LA culture that it feels inaccessible to anyone that's not in a context very similar to this film. It just feels like you're kind of watching this other world. Some of that, even as I mentioned, is the slang, all sorts of little references to places that they're going. They just kind of reference different neighborhoods as if you you know the different areas of LA and what it implies if you go there, if you live there. And I'm in Central Texas. I don't know any of that. So there's just a lot of things like that that just kind of made the movie always kind of feel like it's at arm's length. And then as much as it's trying to go for that awkward, cringe, uncomfortable humor with parents saying all sorts of uncomfortable, uh, tone deaf, racial things in these contexts that just, ooh, for everyone that's really funny. There's two or three that just feel really forced and contrived where the parents are just being too obtuse, going too far. There's there's a lot of things in it that there's just like the feels like it was written by people kind of in a bubble that have a very narrow understanding of how people relate to one another and what relationships should be like. So I think it was well-intentioned. There's I, I love the cast here. There are funny moments the film as a whole did not come together. In fifth place, Shin Ultraman. This is another movie that I watched in connection to it showing at Fantastic Fest back in September. And uh, they did the Shin treatment to Godzilla a few years back and it was a big success. And so they applied that same concept to Ultraman. And um, I actually probably watched more Ultraman than I did Godzilla back when I was growing up. They brought over one of the Ultraman shows, dubbed it, put it on US television at like six in the morning and I'd wake up early, whatever day of the week it played, and I would watch the episode. So I kind of have a certain amount of nostalgia for Ultraman while it was never something that I was super into. So I was very curious to check this out. And it, and it was a it was an interesting novelty. It was, it was different enough that it was kind of like, oh, I'm glad I checked that out, but I would never rewatch that. I don't know who I'd recommend that to, and it didn't didn't fully work. There, some of that is that just kind of the direction they took some things made it tough for me to kind of have someone specifically to root for. It gets kind of trippy and weird in a way that I wasn't expecting as it kind of goes along, and uh, some of that is just is very different, <laughs> kind of what I was expecting, what I'm used to. I used to watch in 30 minute sections back in the 90s and watching the two hour version is like, all right, I'm glad I gave that a try. Maybe it's not for me. Kind of like when your buddy takes you out to a new restaurant for a type of food you've never had before and you go, I'm glad I tried that. It's not for me. That's essentially what kind of I felt after watching Shin Ultra. In fourth place, Shotgun Wedding, a new streaming movie with Jennifer Lopez, Josh Dumal, Lenny Kravitz, as well as Jennifer Coolidge, who steals the show here. And it's a totally watchable movie while not being particularly good or doing anything memorable with its premise and concept. Basic idea that you're at a wedding and then pirates show up and it turns into die hard at a wedding with, instead of it being just one person trying to take out all the pirates, it's both the bride and the groom teaming up while working through a big fight that they had right before the wedding. So die hard as a rom-com. And if that sounds like a simple enough concept, fun enough concept, and it is, that's why it's light watchable entertainment. Thank you for the cake knife. I freaking love this cake knife. But also with that concept, you immediately think of how much better it could be. Even watching the trailer, certain sequences that are set up, they should be better than they actually are. Like the even the shotgun concept where you see Jennifer Lopez in the torn wedding dress holding the shotgun. When that sequence plays out, you think it's going one place and you're like, all right, here it is. And it totally lets you down in ways that it's like, what? What? Why did you do that? <laughs> like, what happened here? Because that was very lackluster how you paid off that image of her with the shotgun. But it's kind of across the board, everything except Jennifer Coolidge didn't work really as well as it should. And halfway through the movie, I kind of pulled up the Wikipedia article just to a little bit like who directed this. It's from the person that directed Pitch Perfect. So right there, like, I love Pitch Perfect. 
Why isn't this more like, had more fun like Pitch Perfect? And uh, it turns out like Ryan Reynolds was originally supposed to be the star in it. And I don't want to pick on Josh Duhamel or anything like that. But when you're watching this movie and you think, oh man, what if that had been Ryan Reynolds? All of these lines would have been so much funnier. His reactions, Josh Duhamel is just not Ryan Reynolds. He's just not. In particular, in movies like this, where you need to be do a little bit of action, you need to be funny. Man, Ryan Reynolds, he's so good at that. And so you just you're watching it, imagining that that better version of the film with Ryan Reynolds. Once as soon as you have that, and even after I read that, there were certain lines of dialogue, and it felt like a Ryan Reynolds little joke, except Josh Duhamel sang it, and. He's not Ryan Reynolds, so it just didn't work. And so I just felt like our main lead guy here kind of miscast. Even the way some of the, the sequences are set up, there is at least two different times where an action sequence happened and we're like, wait, how did that person die? And we had to rewind it to like, I'm still not sure exactly what happened, but at least I understand how I think it's implying they got knocked out or killed. It's just the the way the action is shot is confusing. Number of sequences are just staged really poorly. And that's frustrating because it's it's like a fun, light little concept. You know, Jennifer Lopez is great in movies like this. And uh, the it's like the movie's very, and she's very well aware of the fact that uh, she's a hot person in her 50s. And so the movie <laughs> lingers on her in certain sequences, just trying to show off her body to remind us like, hey, look, look, she's in great shape, almost to an awkward degree at times. And uh, so she's great in the movie. Jennifer Coolidge steals a bunch of lines of dialogue. Nobody with my family. Oh, Cheech Marin's in there too, just a little bit. He doesn't get as many fun moments as you'd hope, you know, getting Cheech Marin in a movie like this. I will say this, it has one of the best kills I've ever seen in a rom-com. Take that as you will, but it's watchable enough. If, if I had to watch it again, I'd be fine with it, but it all of it could have been better. That's the frustrating thing here. Hey, real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your ranking of the January movies that you saw. And if I missed some things that you think I would like, I can think of two movies that a bunch of you will be recommending down below in the comments. I wanted to see them. I planned on seeing them. Timing just didn't work out. But let me know about those down below in the comment section. Also remember, I'm gonna be Fan Expo Portland in February, Fan Expo Cleveland in March, and then Megacon Orlando at the end of March, at the beginning of April. And uh, I'll be doing panels, meet and greets at all three of those. I'd love to see you there. I'd love to meet you. In third place, sick. And as a point of reference, the bottom four on here, I would not recommend. Top three on here, I do recommend. Shotgun Wedding's kind of really on the line there. If you're just in the mood for light rom-com action entertainment, it, it's fine. Just not memorable at all. Top three, I do recommend. Sick, only kind of a marginal recommendation. Another movie that I saw at Fantastic Fest back in September. It was kind of fun because the director was there, did an interview in the room and everything like that. And if you don't know what this movie is, it is essentially a COVID era slasher penned by Kevin Williamson. Oh my God. Just one moment. Unlock the uh, door. You have a mask, don't you? The guy behind the Scream franchise, I Know What You Did Last Summer, The Faculty, all of like the, the slashers from my formative years when I was in high school, jump forward. And, he, and he's known for like kind of the meta commentary, clever scripts. So he was one of the screenwriters on this film and applied all of that to kind of COVID. And so, you, and it takes place, I think in... April or May of 2020. So right when th everything was in lockdown, wherever you were at, or maybe, no, it, was, it was March. It's like right as lockdown was taking place. That's where this movie window of time where it happens, I believe. And um, it's good, but it's not great. And I've seen a bunch of other people that really loved it. I was more like, yeah, it, it's almost there. And from my perspective, it either needed more COVID or less COVID, which is a weird thing to say, but it's kind of the wrong mix for me because the opening, the cold open to it, 
It's like people going to grocery stores, March 2020, fighting over toilet paper, all that stuff that we we lived through, all that weirdness, and you know, commenting on it while in a context of a slasher. So very Kevin Williamson, like, ah, oh, gotcha. That's what this movie's gonna be. And then when you get into the the middle chunk of it, it's very COVID light. And it doesn't really take advantage of even certain concept of what you could do with COVID when people are in lockdown and not interacting with other people. And then when you move into the third act, COVID comes back into it and goes super heavy handed COVID. And I thought like, all right, either we need COVID all throughout this thing or probably don't make it a COVID slasher. So it's kind of the, the wrong amount in there. All that said, the way it plays out in the middle, it's kind of like a constant chase movie. Like once the killers show up, we're like in chase run mode. The action's actually shot pretty cool. It's like a real visceral dynamic nature of it. Like you feel like you're present in the kitchen when someone's thrown over a table. When someone stabbed you like, whoa, you kind of feel it. So it has a real nice vibe to it. And so it's like one of those movies where I just wish they'd figured out how to, how to do the, the COVID just right. And I think you needed more. And there's opportunities in the middle to do something with that that I think really could have worked. There's more kind of observations. There's more of those distinct, unique things that kind of happened in that window of time with people in isolation that it didn't take advantage of. And in, instead, we're kind of in this isolated cabin away from everything, which you could do an isolated cabin in any slasher, in any context. Isolated cabin isn't a place that I think serves this idea of a COVID slasher. And it, it takes away opportunities of what they could have done if they'd reworked the story just a little bit um, to put it in a different context. So uh, I, I liked it. It was good. If you're a Kevin Williamson fan, definitely check it out. I don't think it's great the way a bunch of other people do. A runner up, Missing. Missing is a follow up to the movie Searching from a few years back, but it's a standalone story. You don't need to watch Searching in order to watch the movie Missing. And if you don't know the concept of both of these films, essentially they're movies that are shot entirely from the perspective of computer screens, where if you're watching a character, it's because they're they're looking at their webcam. They're on FaceTime on their phone. You're following what they're doing on a browser. You can see security camera footage, things like that. And it'll cut to news broadcasts that people are watching in browsers on the internet. And a few years back when Searching came out, like I was like reluctantly went to go see it. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tolerate a movie that's entirely from the perspective of a computer screen and webcams. And it really surprised me. I thought searching was was like great. It was so well done. And I was like, I don't know how you could make a movie like this better. And they took full advantage of the concept, all the things that you could do with it. It was clever. The whodunit aspect of searching for the person that was missing, all of that worked for me in the movie. So I really liked the movie Searching. So naturally I was interested in missing and what it would be like. And once again, it's a totally standalone story, but there are little references in this movie that make it clear it takes place in the same universe as the movie Searching, but that's not really relevant. It's just another story in this style where a person is missing and this girl needs to track down her, her mother that she can't find and she doesn't know what's kind of going on. And for the first half of the movie, I thought it might be even better than Searching because it's like they learned every lesson from the first movie. Technology advanced a little bit. So there was even more kind of clever things that they could do with how we use technology to interact with other people. There's a bunch of great transitions and the way that it just kind of seamlessly moves between things. It's dynamic, energetic while being fixed on a computer screen. So it's just really well done. Right amount of humor just kind of dropped in there where it references, there's all these things where it, you'll see someone like start typing something into Google or something like that. And you first, you just think they're searching and then you see what they write. And it's something that we've all had a moment where we, we search something like that. And the whole audience like laughed because it's like that shared experience of how we interact with technology. It has a lot of just really clever ways that it's able to add humor into an otherwise kind of tense film. 
For me, it kind of it loses it a little bit in the back half. It's not quite as good. It gets a little bit. The story gets bigger than searching. It tries to be a little bit more ambitious. How it tries to use technology, what happens to the characters involved, and how it captures that and everything. I thought it went too far and it lost me a little bit. Kind of that suspension of disbelief of like, ah, uh, I don't know that I, I can buy into that. You're stretching the gimmick a little bit too far here. So not quite as good, but still one that I really enjoyed. Standouts here, of course, our lead actress, um, uh, is it Storm, Stormy? Uh, um, she has to carry the movie with just this. And she's not in a room with other people. She's just talking to a webcam FaceTime. It's just to carry the movie, be entertaining while also emotional, carries the film. Other one, one here um, is Joaquin Almeida. He's an actor that's been in movies for decades. And he, in, in the nineties, like he was always like the drug kingpin and he still kind of plays that role. He was the bad guy in Fast Five. And he always kind of plays that guy. And in this one, he's actually like this affable, fun person that's trying to help her. Uh, on trying to find her mother who was on vacation. And so he gets to play like a very different type of character and be charming in a a totally different kind of way. So I love seeing him in the film. So uh, a movie that if you like searching, definitely check it out. It's it's good. It's not as good in my mind. It does kind of stretch things a bit too far in the back half, but a solid film worth checking out. But the current number one film of the year, Megan, the film that at first glance looked like, okay, yeah, like a a goofy little January horror film that'll probably have a great opening weekend, disappear and get bad reviews. Then it's Rotten Tomatoes score came out and it was like a 94%. (laughs) <laughs> which movies like this do not get a 94% of Rotten Tomatoes, comes out opening weekend, only costs $12 million. It makes $30 million. And then in its second week, it had a real small decline, which horror movies don't do. So out of the blue, this movie, Megan, that seemed like goofy, the TikTok crowd seemed to run with it. A movie explodes. And now we have our new killer doll to compete with Chucky. We have Megan. And uh, I missed the press screening for it. And then I was out of town the weekend it came out because I was at Fan Expo, New Orleans. So I went to go see it as quick as I could. Went on like a a Monday at lunchtime. I think I'm going to be the only person in the theater. And the theater actually had quite a few people in it. And it's a good time. Obviously, it's number one on the list. It's my number one movie of the year. So obviously, I dug the film. And it's not mind-blowing. It's not reinventing the wheel. It just takes kind of a simple concept of a doll that becomes, that has this AI, something's a little bit funky in there that takes it too far. And it it just finds all the right things to do with that concept. You know, it's a very reminiscent of what happened with Child's Play 2019, but a better version of it. And some of that is that it incorporates kind of ideas that were in like Rise of the Planet of the Apes about the corporations and how they handle things. Some of it is that it's self-aware enough to kind of be winking at the camera just a little bit. Some of it is the design of Megan, the way that she's characterized, the way that she talks, the dance that she does. It's memorable. It's interesting. It's fun. And so it just has a bunch of things that aren't like totally mind blowing. They're not the freshest ideas out there, but you put them all together in the right mix and you just get a really fun, watchable horror film that has some humor, has some kills that are nice. It has some interesting enough ideas in there and it turns out to be much better than it had any right to be. And looks like we're going to get a franchise out of the whole thing. And I'm, I'm totally game for it. I'd love to spend more time with Megan brutally killing people to protect uh, the girl that she's invested in. Like just all these kind of things about even the way that it kind of discusses the way that Megan is treated by the aunt that takes is taking care of the daughter as kind of a replacement for having to deal with real human emotions, the way that children get addicted to technology. It actually gets into some, even the psychology of it. Not like, no, we're not getting in depth. It's not like this incredible study of the psychology of childhood trauma. There's just enough in there. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of the corporate stuff. Just a little bit of a bunch of stuff. So even when it's not being funny, it's interesting. When it's not having someone being brutally murdered, 
is interesting. It has all of these different things and just little bits. Pull them together and just get a solid, solid film. That's what it is. And like, how did it, Megan of all films get like a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes? And you want to like, <laughs> interesting studies, like how many of the best picture winners does Megan have a rot better Rotten Tomato score then? Here I am. That's an interesting little study and it's a lot of them. It's insane, right? How did it happen? How did that happen? Because it's a movie that doesn't make any big mistakes, has a bunch of little things that come together that work. So it comes in at number one as the best movie of 2023 as of today, given that I haven't seen actually a lot of movies and I missed some movies that were probably better than this film. Remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. You can check out another video right over there. I don't even know what it's recommending to you. And if you're in the Portland area, the Cleveland area, or in Florida, remember I'm heading your way to do meetups, uh, panels, and fan expos. I'd love to meet you and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.